Well, hi everyone. My name is Alexandra Hudson and we're thrilled that you have chosen to spend a bit of your afternoon with us talking about wisdom and lessons from the life of Marcus Aurelius, one of history's great philosopher kings. Um, I'm thrilled to have uh, Donald Robertson here, an expert on Marcus Aurelius, and um, my longtime partner in crime, Anya Leonard, who runs the fabulous organization Classical Wisdom, who, uh, and she'll share a bit, a bit about Classical Wisdom with you in a few moments, but I'm um, really grateful, grateful to, to be here, to be talking about um, the love of wisdom, and I think we, could, we all agree we could all use a little bit more uh, wisdom in, uh, in our lives and in our leaders today, and um, Plato famously suggested that the best regime would be the one led by people who cared about wisdom and their love of wisdom displaced their love of power and, and things of this world. And uh, we're grateful to have a, a model uh, for that, Marcus Aurelius, uh, a Roman emperor to, um, to look to for that. So Anya, please introduce our, our guest panelists, Donna Robertson, Donald, Donald Robertson and, and introduce yourself and, and we'll, we'll get started. Thank you, Alexa, and um, thank you, uh, sorry, Le uh, Alexandra, sorry, I always say Lexi to you personally, so, no, <laughs> but I just want to say thank you to everybody for joining us today. It's a real pleasure, um, and I know everyone taking your time out on a Tuesday afternoon to learn lessons from the Philosopher King is just a really valuable way of spending our time, and uh, I really appreciate it, as I know everyone here does. Um, my name is Anya Leonard. I am the founder and director of Classical Wisdom, a site dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Uh, we've been operating for about mm, almost nine years now, I think, and uh, been trying to show that the classics are just as important, relevant, enjoyable, and perspective giving than ever, and as always. So um, we're very happy to be part of the classics loving community and to welcome all of our fellow classics lovers. Uh, and we do so by having our memberships, our newsletter, and events like this that I've been doing with Alexa, Alexandra. <laughs> so uh, I want to say thank you to all of you. Now, uh, I'd like to also introduce Donald Robertson who is also a long-term friend now, I can say he is the Scottish Cognitive Behavioral Th Psychotherapist, uh, currently living in Athens, but has also lived in Toronto, so quite international. He is the author of six books on philosophy, including Stoicism and the Art of Happiness, as well as How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, the Stoic Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius. So a perfect uh, speaker on our topic today on the lessons from our philosopher king. So without further ado, thank you, Donald, for, right, for being with us today. Wonderful. Thank oh. you. <laughs> thank you, Anya and Lexi. It's a pleasure to be here. And, and thank I, you for showing my book, Lexi. Yes, I wanted to mention um, to, to, each, to all of you uh, who have chosen to join us, we are giving away five copies of Donald's book. So uh, to be entered into um, to win a copy of this book, I'm going to share uh, our social media handles and feel free to uh, screen cap and tweet about the event. And, and just by tagging us, you'll be automatically um, entered. So I'll go ahead and share that now. And, and just a reminder that even um, if you know people that registered but couldn't make it, we will be sending everyone here a recording um, of, of this event. Oh, um, Phil, it's not letting me paste for some reason. Can I email this to you, the social media handles? Yeah, do that. Sorry. I don't know why. Great. Um, sorry about that. We're, we're, uh, can I just tell everybody, just very quickly, while Alexandra is setting up, is that um, we have previously used another program in the past called GoToWebinar, and we are making this transition to Zoom because we've had so many requests uh, from both speakers and our audience members. So um, I want to thank you in advance for your patience with us by while we're trying this new platform. Uh, we're trying to be more user friendly, but it does require a little bit of adjusting from us. So we appreciate your patience as we make this transition. Thanks, Sonia. Okay, so um, Phil should be sharing those social media handles. Um, 
tweet about the event throughout the event to be entered in. And we have five copies of Donald's book to give away in case you're just arriving. And, um, and without further ado, let's, um, let's get started. So Donald, it's been my pleasure to get to know you over the last few months. I reached out to you, Donald, several months ago because you are someone I admire who is popularizing um, ancient wisdom for, for modern minds to borrow uh, the, the catchphrase of classical wisdom. Um, you're looking to the wisdom of the past to revive it and, and show how relevant it is to our modern world and that's what I seek to do with my work, work with my forthcoming book at, at, and say, uh, with St. Martin's Press on, on civility and with my newsletter um, Civic Renaissance dedicated to reviving the wisdom of the past and you do that so well Donald so I'd, I'd love to hear from you what is wisdom and why do you think it matters why does that why do you care about it well um actually I honestly think the, and this is a very simple piece of advice. It's a, I think this is a simple, powerful message that we get from Socrates. Socrates and the Dialogues of Plato says some quite obscure, difficult things. But there's also sometimes a very simple message. And one of those simple messages is that we should care more about wisdom. We should talk more about wisdom. We should try to define wisdom and understand what the word wisdom or its equivalents in other languages mean. Um, so I think this is a very, very, very important question and one that should be asked more often. Many people would benefit simply from asking that very question. And the way I like to answer it, my guide in life often, you know, if I get too lost in my head and theories and technical stuff, uh, my, it's what saves me is I have a little girl, like who's 10 years old now, and I try to imagine how I would explain things to my daughter, or I actually do explain things to my daughter. And so I, I told her once that I thought it was important to understand what wisdom is. And she said, well, what is wisdom, Daddy? What does it mean? Um, and the way I explain it to her is that I say, well, I think wisdom consists in knowing what's most important in life. And also in knowing that some of the things that other people think are important aren't actually that important in reality. And I think that's one way of understanding what practical wisdom would look like. Someone in life who we look at and view as being very wise, I think we would often use it as characteristics. And actually, there's a technical definition of wisdom that's given by the Stoics, which is that wisdom consists in knowing the difference between good, bad, and indifferent things. Or they could have put that more concisely by saying that wisdom consists in grasping the nature of the good or the definition of the good. Mm -hmm. That's not dissimilar to the way that I would explain it to my little daughter. I love that. And Socrates told us um, the beginning of wisdom is knowledge of ignorance. The, the book of uh, Solomon, another wise man in history, tells us that the beginning of wisdom is, is the fear of God. Uh, Anya, you are an expert in the classical world and classical philosophy. Uh, what do you think about wisdom and why it matters? Well, I really think wisdom is a way of approaching the world. Um, I think people can get so caught up in day-to-day -day things and, and we end up missing out on our lives because we're just being distracted by these small details and worries and frustrations. And so to me, wisdom is the act of actively thinking about how one should live their life. And by stepping back and thinking about how to live your life, you, you're actively improving it simply by that action because you're, you're being considerate and, and not just being on the treadmill of life. You've got to get off it sometimes and really think where are you running towards? Why are you running there? And how should you run there? And I think to be actively trying to be a good person and to seek out a good life for yourself and those around you and, and to your community, you have to ask questions and think about them and think about yourself. And so to me, that that's like the love of philosophy, the love of wisdom is to spend your time actively considering how you should live your life. I love that, that there's an active and also kind of a um, less active, a more contemplative um, uh, act, act of, of, of wisdom as well. As you mentioned, Anya, stepping back and reflecting on what it means to live a good life. As Donald said, what's the difference between between good and bad? And I think this concept of, of reflection of, of leisure, of skole, as the ancient Greeks called it, that, that's something we'll return back to um, as, as we talk about wisdom and, and reflection on, on the good life. 
But uh, for now, Donald, I'd love to hear from you. Who is Marcus Aurelius? Tell us, tell us about his life. Maybe that maybe this is someone's first time ever hearing his name. They were just intrigued by the idea of a conversation on wisdom. So tell us about who he who he is and why you've written a book and and more Ooh. books coming out on him. <laughs> I don't know. I've actually written three books about Marcus Aurelius. Oh, already? Okay. Like, kind of. Like I'm halfway through one of them. Like, um, okay. So how to think like a member is kind of about Marcus Aurelius? I just finished working on a graphic novel about his life and philosophy, and I'm in the middle of writing a biography for Yale. Um, about Marcus Aurelius. And then hopefully I'll get to write about something different in the future. Yeah. <laughs> so who is Marcus Aurelius? When I, I wanted to write about Stoic philosophy, and I, I thought a good way of doing that would be to write about a famous Stoic. And there were lots of them, more than people realize. There were about 80 ancient Stoics who, mm. whose names we know, actually. And there must have been much more in the 500 years during which Stoicism flourished. And we know a little bit about Zeno, who was the founder of Stoicism, but we know a lot more about Marcus Aurelius. We know more about Marcus Aurelius, actually, than we do about most ancient philosophers, mm. for the simple reason that he was what I like to refer to as a big deal back in the day. Like, <laughs> so he was an important guy. He was a Roman emperor. And for that reason, we have three major biographies of his reign. We have archaeological evidence evidence from coins and inscriptions and lots of fragments referring to him as well. So he was the last famous Stoic of antiquity, actually. We hardly hear anything about Stoics, funnily enough, after his death. And he, he was a Roman emperor and a, a Stoic philosopher. And he wrote a book that we call The Meditations today. And it's one of the most widely read and much loved spiritual and philosophical classics of all time. And he's also, played by Richard Harris in act one of the movie Gladiator. Great movie. a bit of a dated reference. Now, <laughs> yeah. That's how some people know him. <laughs> really? Yeah. And a sequel's coming out, Donald. Didn't you tell me the that? Sequel, the allegedly, <laughs> the sequel is being written at the moment. Presumably Marcus Aurelius won't be in that one since he passed He's away. He's not in it. He he might, maybe yeah. he would be in it in flashbacks. Flashback or something. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Um, so I think that talking about Marcus Aurelius now and wisdom now is particularly uh, timely since um, Marcus Aurelius was a leader who um, was, was led by wisdom, or at least tried to let wisdom, a love of wisdom and a love of virtue and self-sacrifice, these stoic values guide him. And we are emerging from a time in our world of widespread suffering and devastation um, and, and, and uh, because of the pandemic, because of plague and pestilence. And Marcus Aurelius also, I understand, uh, led and was emperor through a time of plague and pestilence. Mm -hmm. So, what can we what can we learn from his life and how wisdom led him um, during during a, during this time of crisis, where we know um, times of crisis reveal people's character, they reveal uh, or a lack of character. And I think we've seen that in our own time and, and the, our own crisis of of leadership now. But what can we learn from Marcus Aurelius in his life? Well, actually, I think the meditations at a stretch could be viewed is a psychological manual for coping with a pandemic. Um, in part, because as it happens, although it doesn't make that much reference to the Antonine Plague, it was written in the middle of a, a plague, a pandemic that's far worse than the one that we're facing today. Um, it seems to be in a variation of smallpox virus. We don't know for sure, but mm. most scholars think it might have been smallpox. It was a, a horrible plague and the Romans didn't really know how to deal with it at all. So to some extent, the meditations is Marcus Aurelius trying to live through this catastrophic period in Roman history, which really um, triggered a kind of cascade of catastrophes because uh, the Roman legions were devastated by plague. And so the so-called barbarians along the Northern frontier, the tribes along the Northern frontier saw that and thought, this really seems like it might be a good time to invade. Hmm. Why, and so then Rome was subject to a massive invasion. The northern provinces uh, were overrun and the, this tribal army crossed the Alps and uh, attacked, besieged the city of Aquileia in northern Italy. And so the, the citizens of Rome thought the, the city of Rome itself was uh, potentially threatened. And so this was a huge economic crisis. Uh, it was a humanitarian crisis, it was a military crisis, and uh, Marcus Aurelius found himself in the middle of 
one catastrophe after another. In fact, the historian Dio uh, Cassius says that he admires Marcus Aurelius because although, in a sense, he wasn't the most successful of Roman emperors, um, he was one who endured such misfortune. It's almost as if the gods were testing him hmm. uh, to see like, how he would cope under the pressure. And the meditations of Marcus Aurelius contains a lot of advice. It's actually a little bit difficult to summarize it. The first book that I wrote about the psychological techniques and stoicism, it's called The Philosophy of CBT, listed 18 different psychological techniques that you can find in the meditations and the other stoic writings. But I'll pick one as an example. And actually, it's one that I know that you and Anya will be interested in, and it relates to where I'm at the moment. I'm at uh, Parco Academia Platinus right now. Uh, it's outside my window. Uh, so I'm at the original location of Plato's Academy in Athens. Uh, that's where I'm living right now. And the Acropolis isn't far from here. So in the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, repeatedly, particularly towards the end of the book, he describes doing, and he says he does this regularly, a psychological technique that modern scholars following Pierre Hadot call the view from above. And it's very popular with people around Stoicism today. And actually we find it in other philosophical traditions, particularly the Pythagoreans also describe it as a similar technique. Ovid describes it very clearly, for example, in the Tripos of the Pythagoreans. Um, and Marcus will imagine picturing things from high above. And when he does that, he says, in one of the most widely quoted passages, uh, a mind uh, free from violent passions is like an impenetrable citadel. And when I read that, people like to quote it. I often wondered, I wonder what the Greek word for impenetrable citadel is. And I never got around to looking it up until a few months ago. I looked up and I realized that the Greek word that he uses, uh, because he writes in Greek, and he, which is translated as impenetrable citadel, is Acropolis, of course. And that makes a lot more sense out of that passage. And when he describes looking down from this Acropolis upon worldly affairs, that's the view from above consists in imagining that we're looking down on our lives and all the chaos that's going on around us, the pandemic, the political controversy and so on from an elevated position. We're getting a helicopter mm. view from it. That's what he's doing. He says, imagine you're looking down at political assemblies and divorces and marriages and uh, trades uh, being done in the marketplace and so on and so forth and legal battles. And he says, and, and looking down on marketplaces and the word he uses for that in Greek is uh, agora. Uh, that's the plural, agoras. And that's exactly what you see when you look down from the Acropolis. It looks down the, in the Acropolis in Athens, it looks down on the Greek, the Athenian agora where, among other things, Socrates was tried and executed. And so this is a very resonant uh, passage. Uh, it's two passages, actually, in the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, where he describes a view that would be very familiar to Greek philosophers, particularly Athenian philosophers, the view from the Acropolis, the Parthenon, the sacred temple of the goddess of wisdom, Athena, looking down on the Agora, where all these dramatic events unfolded, and seeing these things from a broader, more elevated uh, perspective, a kind of divine perspective, like Zeus looking down mm. from Mount Olympus in Clash of the Titans. Uh, mm. People have probably seen that sort of image in other movies. And so one way that we can deal with the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment is by just reading those passages in Marcus Aurelius and trying to get into a kind of similar, uh, more uh, broader uh, perspective on things. That's a great point, Donald. Disconnecting yourself from a, a current trauma, a current difficult situation is helpful. Detaching a little bit is helpful to gaining perspective that can allow you to move through it. And in your book, uh, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, you talk about how that, that's also very resonant of modern cognitive behavioral therapy practices. That's your practice. And you, you mentioned that the, the CBT theorists or practitioners in the early days, they were influenced by the Stoics, which is really interesting. Um, at Civic Renaissance, we talk a lot about the great conversation, just this dialogue of, of, um, of thinkers and those that have come before them and before them, and to see how old ideas continue to resurface and reiterate and, and the application of old ideas to new problems. I think is is really is really beautiful and 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 and, and relevant. Um, Anya, is there anything that Donald said that you that you care to care to respond to or care to add to? 
Yeah, I mean, I was thinking it's it's interesting because when people think of Marcus Aurelius as a really outstanding person, um, you know, they think of him maintaining his character in in the face of this plague and pestilence and military conflict. But I think he really showed his personality and his not personality is probably the correct word, um, his resolution and his character uh, before that. And even when he sort of was first chosen to take and plucked, you know, sort of magically, it would seem out of a civilian life and the trajectory that he was supposed to have and sort of ushered into greatness, um, he still maintained a quality that I think um, is part of why we should be listening to some of his lessons and, and reasons. And um, I'm gonna make a really comical reference here for a second. I don't know if anybody's ever watched the, the comedian Bill Burr. And he, he talks about like Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, cheating on his wife and everyone's like, oh, you know, how could he do that? And he's like, you don't, you don't know what it's like to be him. You don't know what it's like to, to get off a plane and have beautiful women throwing themselves at you. And so similarly, a lot of us have never really been in the experience of having that much power or influence or wealth. And to maintain your character in the face of that, I think is, is harder than, than plague and pestilence in a way, because plague and pestilence like forces you to think of about what is most important, but corruption and power can tempt you away from what's most important. So to maintain your resolve in the face of that, I think is is uh, where we really find a reason to have a great deal of respect and to learn from him. That's wonderful, Anya, which leads me to my second question, or another question rather, which is, Tell us about the making of a, of a philosopher king, Donald. What what did Marcus Aurelius read? Who was he absolutely enchanted by? What were some early formative experiences in his life um, that formed him and helped him have the metal, have the stamina, the, the character, the integrity that allowed him to lead well, as Anya said, through really trying times? I think that's something we can think we can learn from today as we're reflecting on this post-pandemic era. And we can how can we improve our education system and how can we have more more people that love wisdom? Them. Gosh, that's a really, really good question. And uh, first thing I'll say is we kind of know more actually about Marcus Aurelius' earlier life than we do about some of the other periods in his life, funnily enough. Hmm. Because we know quite a bit about his education in some regards. And also I'll just mention one other thing in, in response uh, to what Anya said that makes a, a lot of connection there, which is we often think today of Hadrian as being, in many ways, one of the better Roman emperors. But Hadrian, towards the end of his life, went crazy and was pretty depraved and killed a lot mm. of people and had spies everywhere, basically. Maybe a bit, a bit blunt about that. But there was a, quite a dark side to Hadrian, uh, and he, he degenerated quite badly. And that is the Hadrian that Marcus Aurelius knew. And Marcus, for a time, I think for about six months or so, was brought up in Hadrian's villa towards the end of Hadrian's life. So he's brought into Hadrian's household. And he saw an emperor collapsing psychologically wow. under the weight of his own responsibilities, surrounded um, by sycophants on one side and by traitors, if you like, uh, on the other side. Hadrian kind of torn apart by this and turning into a tyrant. When Hadrian died, the Senate refused to deify him and they wanted to annul his acts until Marcus Aurelius' adopted father, Antonius, wow. persuaded them to be more moderate in this world. So Hadrian's a very controversial figure. And I'm pretty sure that Marcus Aurelius saw that and thought, I don't want to be that guy. Hmm. I, and so I think he was really divided uh, within himself about whether he wanted to be an emperor. And what Quite long story short, I think happened was that there was uh, an intermediary uh, emperor, Antoninus Pius, and Marcus idolized him and saw him as the complete opposite of Hadrian. And I think Antoninus persuaded Marcus that it was possible to live well even in a palace, as he mm -hmm. puts it and famously in the meditations by showing him that uh, power didn't have to corrupt. And so the, and that leads us into your question in a way, which is, you know, I think Marcus embraced training in Stoicism in part because he felt that he 
wasn't naturally uh, as um, wise or uh, even tempered as Antoninus. And he worried that there might be a little bit of Hadrian in his character. And Marcus, I think, saw Stoicism as a way of training himself to possess some of the character traits that Antoninus Pius perhaps possessed naturally. Mm. Um, and so we see Marcus embarking on this lifelong quest. And it started off with him, gosh, Marcus's education. I'll give you the very abbreviated version of this. Marcus had an unusual education. Hmm. He, like most Roman nobles during that period, he was born during a, a period in Roman history called the Second Sophistic, when Greek culture uh, was trendy, uh, particularly among Roman nobles who were all fluent in Greek. And they studied Greek oratory and rhetoric. And so Marcus was immersed in what we would call uh, sophistry, uh, the art of, of rhetoric uh, and oratory. And that was expected of him. He seems to have embraced it and enjoyed it. Some people read the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius and massively underestimate his literary ability, in my view. Marcus trained for decades under literally the leading experts on Greek and Roman writing mm. of his era. Herodes Atticus, um, who is famous in Athens because he the Odeon of Herodes Atticus still stands today in the, uh, at the foot of the, the Acropolis, um, who was a sophist, a Greek uh, orator who trained Marcus, who was a family friend, and Marcus Cornelius Fronto, who was kind of a Latin sophist, if we can use that phrase, and taught Marcus uh, Latin uh, rhetoric. So he was highly trained in the uh, in use of uh, Greek and Latin. And that, I think, people... Uh, underestimate that it, there's evidence of it in the meditations I feel mm. and uh, he also what's unusual I mean that's not that's the normal part of his education what's unusual about his education is the amount of philosophy that he studied um, which was and also the early age at which he was immersed in philosophy so philosophy was considered normally a kind of advanced study for Roman nobles of this period but we're told that Marcus began studying philosophy when he was 12 years old which is pretty young <laughs> and uh, exceptionally so and what's also odd about it was that we're told that the guy, by Marcus, uh, we're told that the guy that introduced him to philosophy was his painting teacher, mm -hmm. a guy called Diognetus, who was Greek. And, uh, you know, he doesn't say anything about learning painting from this guy, but he says a lot about uh, this guy discussing philo philosophical virtues and stuff with him. Um, and then Marcus trained under a number of eminent philosophers, uh, some Roman, some Greek and mainly Stoics, several Stoics, uh, mainly Junius Rusticus, but also uh, he seems to have trained in Platonism and uh, in Aristotelian And he seems clearly, he doesn't mention an Epicurean teacher, strangely, but in the meditations he shows that he's quite familiar with Epicurean texts. And so he's familiar with a broad range of philosophical writings. But in the meditations, uh, one way of looking at it is that he, uh, the, the person he most frequently quotes by far is Epictetus. Hmm. And he, um, there's a lot that I can say about that, but he's particularly interested in Epictetus. And the person he quotes um, second uh, to that in terms of frequency is Heraclitus. Um, who was considered a uh, who's a pre-Socratic philosopher is considered quite closely associated with the Stoic school, hmm. and Marcus also refers quite frequently to the Greek tragedies. Interestingly, which he's he's very familiar with, and and uses quotes from often to illustrate his philosophical views. So he was well educated in literature and a broad range of philosophies, but particularly steeped in Stoic philosophy to an extent that wasn't unique, but was somewhat unusual for the period and I'll mention in passing my view that that possibly was the doing of his mother. Hmm. Which is good foreshadowing because we're going to talk about the influence of his mother later in our conversation. Thank you Donald. So Donald based on what you said I take from that that um, some core aspects from Marcus Aurelius's education that could be relevant for our moment as we seek to revive what's worked well in the past are um, 
love of uh, our, our education and, and philosophy and ideas, which literally means philosophia, love of wisdom, um, and, and just cultivating a love of what is good and, and virtuous and, and, and pursuing that um, because you love it and, 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 and avoiding vice because it is morally contemptible to you. I think that's a, a really wonderful point. Um, I love the story you shared, Donald, about Hadrian, that, that he, he kind of saw history up close and, and very much in the style of Plutarch, like saw what was praiseworthy in him and also Antoninus Pius, I think that was his name, saw what was praiseworthy in him and wanted to emulate that and emulate what was good in Hadrian and saw what was contemptible in Hadrian, you know, having sycophants on one side and conspirators on the other and wanted to avoid that those excesses. And um, and so seeing that, you know, using history as kind of this, this moral tool um, is, is a, a powerful tool that has been used across history was clearly effective in, in Marcus Aurelius's life. And I think that's one that we can also um, revive and should revive today as we, we, history, as we know, is very controversial today, but there, it has been used really effectively um, across time and place. And I think that's something we can, um, we can look to. And, and also art, Donald. I love that he loved Greek tragedies. <laughs> that um, I don't think we use art enough in our education and just kind of cultivating an appreciation of beauty and language and um, um, style. Um, so thank you, Donald, for that, that overview. Anya, what do you, what do you take away from what Donald shared about um, Marcus Aurelius' education and maybe what we can learn from that in our own era today? Well, I, I want to make a few quick points also. Um, one, just to add to the comments before, I'm no way justifying Arnold Schwarzenegger's behavior. I think uh, <laughs> I'm actually trying to say that he isn't clearly a good person. He, um, Second, uh, to add also to your point, Donald, about um, Marcus's literary abilities, and um, you know, this is very well known, but for some of you who are uh, still learning about Marcus Aurelius and the medita Meditations, Meditations was written as a journal, not as a piece of literature. And I think it's very important to remember that when reading it, because it reads like a journal and not a piece of literature. So if you're looking for it to be like a concise, literary work it's 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 that's not how it was written and that should not be how it, it is read um and i think it the value of it as being his meditations is this a fantastic insight into somebody's mind and thinking and the way they want to be uh and to see that as the value of it but yes you see his literary style still within it clearly because he was so influenced in like the homeric references um from his Tutor, tutor uh, Alexander, um, definitely. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, I, I definitely agree that there's something over the last year and a half has definitely revealed is that we can start thinking about education in a different way. And for some of us, um, you know, and I know this is something you believe very strongly in too, Alexandra, is to think about education for our youth and for ourselves. Um, it's something I've been very passionate about for years and years. And to have this last year show us that we can change things very easily. It, we've had to. We've had, we've to, had to the classroom <laughs> without. But yeah. in, the, in the same way as the Stoics, like you see something that has obviously been very difficult. But if we can take the positives out of it and see what's in our control and adapt and change and to improve on, this is a perfect time to do do so. Um, and I think there's a lot of elements in reintroducing philosophy at a young age. I mean, if it worked for Marcus, I think it can work for, <laughs> for the rest of us. Uh, bringing back literature, the love of poetry, the love of theater. Um, I think these are wonderful things to add. And, uh, you know, personally, with my own daughter, I, she just loves hearing mythology and stories. And mm. I don't think you can start young enough. Thank you, Anya. So Donald, um, what did what did Marcus Aurelius see as the barriers to, to virtue and to wisdom? And, and what is different about Marcus Aurelius' context from today? And, and, and what is the same as today? And maybe how can how can how can we overcome the barriers to, to loving wisdom and pursuing virtue in our everyday? This kind of the so stoic philosophy is actually very notoriously systematic in the ancient world. And there's a, there's, there's a kind of formal answer to that question in a way, which is on the one hand, the barriers to living in accord with wisdom and virtue uh, are fear and desire uh, from within ourselves. 
And also from another perspective, the Stoics believed that our natural propensity to respond to pain and pleasure and uh, to be influenced by society, uh, corrupted by society, are factors that potentially act as barriers to living in accord with what they consider to be their own true nature, which is uh, reason. And uh, so the mark the whole of the meditations in a way gives us a, a peek at somebody trying uh, to deal with these challenges of living, which the Stoics believed are kind of universal. Marcus Aurelius happened to be in quite a historically unusual position. But I'll just mention actually one of the oddities about that book, although it does contain some kind of peculiar historical references in a way, or kind of opaque references. Um, one of the reasons that people love the meditations is that, I'll give you an example. The most widely quoted passage, perhaps, is Meditations 2.1, where Marcus says, every morning when you awaken, tell yourself that you'll meet ungrateful and meddlesome people and so on. Um, but he doesn't name any of these people. Uh, he doesn't give any clue who they were. And so we might read it and think, that's that guy that works across from me in the office. Or, you know, that's my mother-in-law or my father-in-law or somebody like that. That's my brother-in-law. Like, so we'll, we'll project ourselves into Marcus's comments because they're artfully vague for some odd reason. Um, and sometimes, actually, we kind of forget that Marcus is situated in this kind of world historic position. I mean, he's writing this. Um, he's in the middle of the Marcomannic War, the first Marcomannic War, and he's... I, on those mornings, he would have been negotiating with enemy chieftains and so on. And he'd been uh, uh, facing subsequently, he faced a civil war in the Roman Empire. Um, so when he talks about every morning when you wake up, tell yourself that you may meet treacherous people. Like, mm -hmm. In part, he's talking about such world historic events as civil war, perhaps. Although when we read it, it's so vague that it seems to apply to almost any situation that we might find ourselves in because he seldom names names or alludes to specific historical situations, except perhaps in book one where he's talking about the individuals that he's to model in life. And so I think that there are many things that we could take from Marcus uh, in terms of specific pieces of advice about overcoming barriers to virtue. Uh, like I say, there are maybe about 18 separate psychological techniques that he describes. The view from above is one of them. Um, another thing that Marcus does frequently throughout the meditations, one of the things he does most often is to constantly ask himself what his fundamental goal is in life hmm. and to constantly uh, draw his attention back to what he considers most important to kind of recalibrate and realign himself to his core values, basically. And so he'll often specifically ask himself of any action that he's undertaken, how does this serve your fundamental goal in life? Mm. And that's kind of like some, it, it's, it's loosely related to things that we might do in behavior therapy today, um, where we encourage people to think more deeply about the specific activities that they're engaged in throughout the day and how they might relate to their core values so that's one way that one barrier to change is, is our propensity to lose sight of our core values and our true goal, to drift from it. Mm. And one remedy for that that Marcus uses very frequently is to constantly remind himself of that and to check his actions against this standard that he set mm. himself by asking. Uh, if you're spending time on Facebook or something, you would ask yourself, how does this actually contribute to my mm. fundamental goal in achieving moral wisdom? Uh, does it lead me towards that? Or does it actually lead me away from it? Marcus thinks we should do that quite frequently. That's great. So no, I, I love that's nothing's innocuous. Everything is either propelling you towards your goal and is is corroborating and solidifying your inner core and your inner values, or it's taking away from that. That is beautiful. I love that. Yet it occurs to me, Donald, that you know one barrier to wisdom that exists today that didn't exist in Marcus Aurelius' era 
is, I don't know, our information age. Uh, mm -hmm. We are more educated and more maybe knowledgeable. We know more about the natural world, about the body, science, than, and then past eras that Marcus Aurelius did. Yet, are we any wiser? Uh, another is technology. That's very different. Like, there was no mm -hmm. social media. There was no Twitter in Marcus Aurelius' age. Like, tell us, I'd love to dive into that with you a little bit and then hear what Anya has to say. Like, would Marcus Aurelius have been mm -hmm. on Twitter? Or would he have shunned it? Would he have just used it to tweet out Epictetus? Or would he have been like, you know what? This is not a place mm -hmm. where anyone can cultivate virtue. <laughs> well, for sure, they didn't have social media. They didn't have Twitter in the Roman Empire, right? But we can definitely draw parallels. So, like, uh, Marcus wrote and delivered many speeches and also issued pamphlets and published letters. And that would have been the ancient Roman precursor of social media, in a sense. And so but I think that's evidence enough to suggest that Marcus probably would have used social media in the same way that he published speeches. Um, it's just another method of communication. But he would have been uh, discerning and judicious about his use of social media, I think. And I, there's something else I'd like to point out for, you know, the, the sophists uh, are a philosophical, are, are a cultural movement um, who are kind of quasi philosophers. Actually, Socrates says the sophists look identical to philosophers in many cases, mm. sound identical to philosophers. But he said that that can be confusing because what they are doing is fundamentally, in many cases, leading in the opposite direction from philosophers. And so the sophists were orators, public speakers in ancient Greece who made a living by going around and, and giving speeches and teaching other people um, how to give persuasive speeches. And this was a very important part. Uh, they were kind of part motivational guru, um, part, part uh, legal advocate. Um, and I used to think that the, there isn't really a kind of clear cut modern equivalent to them. And in, in, in many ways, this is just in a, a kind of uh, quirk of the historical period. Like I mentioned earlier, there was a renaissance in popularity of Greek sophistry during the, uh, the early part of the Roman Empire, uh, during the lifetime of Marcus Aurelius. Um, and then one day I realized actually, Facebook is a sophist and Twitter is a sophist in a sense, in the following simple regard. Socrates' beef with the sophists was, and, and by the way, they were frenemies. Socrates really admired the sophists as well and would quote them, um, but he also had some concerns about them. He, uh, his main concern was that they literally competed against each other to win prizes by giving speeches, and they would say whatever got the biggest round of applause. Um, so sometimes the sophist might quote something that Socrates has said if it got a big round of applause, or he might say the opposite if that got a bigger round of applause. A sophist might say one thing in one city and say the opposite in another city, like just adapting his speech to whatever his audience wanted to hear. And he would get paid and earn reputation based on being a, a crowd pleaser. And that was how these guys made a living. They were the like rock stars of the, the age. And Socrates thought, you guys are more interested in acclaim and persuasion than you are in the love of wisdom and the pursuit mm -hmm. of, of truth. This is a concern that I have with you. Well, Facebook and Twitter and other forms of social media work in almost exactly the same way, except we use algorithms. So people will publish things um, and it becomes more and more prominent in our feed, the more people engage with it mm. and the more they react to it, the more likes it gets. The sophists were gunning to get as many likes as possible from their audience and just the same way, really. And they would say whatever people, they, you know, they didn't care about the truth. They would say whatever got the most attention and the biggest reaction, which is kind of how the media works today. And, and Socrates said, yeah, if you carry on doing that, you know, truth goes out the window. Mm. Like, and, uh, you know, really, uh, it's dangerous. And we encounter, this is the same problem that we have today with social media. Um, you know, what gets the most publicity is often what's most alarming or what provokes the most anger. Mm -hmm. um, and we make it worse the more we argue and rail against it, the more attention we give to it. So Stoicism can be seen in a way as a reaction against ancient sophistry and an attempt to help people psychologically protect themselves against it. And I think that's partly the reason why it's become more popular today, because many of the people that are interested in it tell me that they're drawn to Stoicism because they feel overwhelmed by social media and the news media and by alarming 
uh, and provocative information, like stuff, um, media, about things that are beyond their control, like global warming, and political elections in other countries, and conflicts in other countries that are presented in a way that's biased and distorting, and deliberately alarmist and deliberately partisan. And people know that they're being manipulated uh, by social media and the news media. And they struggle to figure out ways to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And they perceive stoicism, rightly in my view, as offering tools that potentially help them to negotiate this labyrinth. Um, can yeah. I? Just, just really quickly, Anya, before I turn to you, I want to do a little promo for Donald's book. We have five copies to give away at this conversation and how you can enter to win. Uh, in case you join late, is uh, speaking of social media and, and Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because I'm going to add to this point. Perfect, perfect. Um, um, Phil will share our social media handles in, uh, in the chat. And uh, just just uh, live tweet this event or screen capture what um, and tweet about what you like about it. We want to hear from you, and you will automatically be entered to win one of five copies of Donald's book, "How to Think Like a Roman Emperor," kind of a channeling Marcus Aurelius's life and thought for today. So go ahead, Anya. Well, no, no. So I I I I do agree with you, Donald. Obviously, on on many and many of those points, and I think definitely Stoicism is fantastic with regards to handling what's outside of our control. And um, I think that doesn't preclude people from being active, you know, politically and socially. And I think that's always a, an important thing. But I'd like to just throw in a few uh, counterpoints, if I may. One, I think the Sophists have gotten a much worse rep than they fully deserve, and that some of them were substantial philosophers in their own right, and that Plato has depicted them very one-dimensionally, and that I don't think all of them were as, you know, uh, charlatans as they kind of, I think there's there's a good amount of uh, discovery since then to, to sort of back up the claim that there might be a little bit more nuance to the sophists, and that I might just say that the rhetoric you know, and, and this is something to kind of tie it all in is that rhetoric is a tool just, and this is something I think the Stoics would completely agree with. Similarly, wealth, like wealth doesn't, isn't necessarily inherently good or bad. It's a tool and you have to use it uh, accordingly. And so rhetoric, you know, I think it's very important for people to study it. So especially if they can find out when it's being used on them, uh, because I think we can, all imagine quickly when you say somebody who says something different town to town. Uh, we have pop in our heads probably a lot of politicians, but you can think of a lawyer, you know, they could be defending, you know, a righteous cause or totally doing something awful using rhetoric as a tool. So um, similarly, just to, to conclude a counterpoint um, is social media. I, I think the algorithms are definitely something to be wary of and we should keep our eyes open but it potentially can be used as a tool if we see it as that and maintain that relationship with it and you know even if it's finding events like this or um, connecting with friends and family it, it has the ability to do horrible things it can also have the ability for connectivity so I think our role is to try to sort through it and be constructive in the way we interact with it and think about it. Yeah, I agree. Some of my best friends are sophists. <laughs> and uh, I'll have you know. And, uh, you know, they're not all bad. Like, we're all sophists in a sense. I think we've all got a little bit of sophists uh, in us. And Socrates and Plato, like, and even the story, Marcus Aurelius is steeped in sophistry. Uh, and uh, Latin and, and Greek rhetoric, that entire tradition. He was surrounded by these people, and some of his best friends literally were sophists, like Herodes Atticus, who's like the, the preeminent sophist of the, the period. It's a family friend of Marcus Aurelius. Um, and Socrates doesn't think they're all bad. Like he, uh, Socrates likes to quote. Actually, I'll tell you just one little aside, a really specific example. Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, um, was converted to philosophy, allegedly, and inspired to become a philosopher by either reading or hearing read book two of Xenophon's Memorabilia Socrates. And we're told that 
and Diogenes Laertius, but he doesn't really explain why this would be a particularly interesting. So we have to go away and look up book two of Xenophon's Memorabilia Socrates. And if we're nerdy enough to do that, we notice that book two of Xenophon's Memorabilia Socrates contains one of the most famous speeches of antiquity, um, which we call today the choice of Hercules. And it was a speech uh, made famous by a sophist called Prodicus. And uh, Xenophon describes Socrates giving his version of the speech and it's a mythological allegory about the god Hercules making a decision about whether to live a, a life of hedonism or a, a life of virtue. And you know, it's what we call an exhortation or protracted in Greek. Um, it's like a, how would you say, like a motivational speech that's designed to inspire people uh, to become philosophers or embrace a life of virtue. And so Zeno read this speech that's derived from Prodicus, a sophist, and that's what inspired him to go out and become a philosopher and to go on and, and found the Stoic school. So the, Sto the, 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 I mean, the Stoics and Socrates didn't, I think, view the sophists as all bad. I think they viewed them as what the kids today call frenemies. <laughs> like they had a kind of love-hate relationship with them. And I think you're right that they would view social media or uh, rhetoric as potentially usable in the service of wisdom. Um, as long as it doesn't become like a, a kind of end in itself, as, as long as it doesn't end up getting out of control. And I, I'll mention another little kind of aside about that. It's just because this, this is a really curious historical fact about the meditations. Um, so we have, in, we also have a cache of letters um, that was found in the 19th century uh, between Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Cornelius Fronto and several other uh, people in their circle. And so we, we get a, an amazing insight into the private life of one of the most powerful men in history. So we get actually get a glimpse of Marcus Aurelius' true character, which isn't really exposed in the meditations. And in real life, he was a really nice guy. He was incredibly affectionate to his friends. Uh, he had a sense of humor. He was a bit of a nerd. And so we really get to know what he was like. He wasn't as, as kind of doer as he comes across as being in the meditations in real life in, those, in these letters. And in those letters, Fronto has an argument with him about the relationship between rhetoric and philosophy. And Fronto says to Marcus implicitly, I'm paraphrasing here, but Fronto says to Marcus, look, philosophy gives you insights and it tends to lead particularly in the Socratic and Stoic tradition, to paradoxical insights, to nuanced insights that are difficult to articulate clearly in language. And so for your own sake and the sake of others, you also need to study rhetoric in order to learn how to articulate these subtle paradoxical concepts clearly and effectively. And you should do that by repeatedly paraphrasing them and trying to judiciously identify just the right word or image to articulate the concept clearly. Now, they have this little debate in the letters. And what's really striking about it, one of the things that struck commentators is the meditations of Marcus Aurelius seems to exemplify this. In the meditations, that's exactly what he seems to be doing. What Fronto, years earlier, had told him to do as a kind of psychological exercise as a, a verbal exercise. In the meditation, we see him taking concepts from Stoic philosophy and find, struggling to find words and metaphors to articulate them more clearly, often repeating himself over and over again in the, in the process. So he's using rhetoric as a way of clarifying his philosophical insights there. Uh, Alexandra, I think we've lost your sound. You're muted, Lexi. Can you unmute yourself? Hi, thanks. Um, so I, I, I accept, um, I love that. I, I accept Anya's premise that technology is a tool. And I'd also say it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mirror of, of human nature, both at its best and at its worst and also amplifies that. Um, I love this story of um, a Twitter bomb. Hey, oh, sorry about that feedback. Is that someone? Is that gone? Yeah. yeah Sorry gone. about that. <laughs> um, 
So Microsoft some years ago introduced to Twitter, uh, Tay, the Twitter bot. And it was artificial intelligence that started tweeting and as AI does, it learned as it, as it went interacting with users. And it started out um, you know, saying humanity is wonderful and people are just the best and I love humans. And then after like eight hours on Twitter, again, like interacting with Twitter users, it started spewing the most horrible, like racist, homophobic, like sexist <laughs> things that you could ever imagine. And, and, and Microsoft took it down right away and like tried to blame Twitter Twi tried to blame Twitter users for <laughs> for um, for corrupting its perfect AI, <laughs> but I think that's a it's a it's a evocative story of like you know social media is a mirror of of, of humanity like 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 many aspects of technology um, like like language like the written word it can be used to so um, so divide division and and toxicity or it could be used to um, to heal and elevate and on that note really quickly i'd love to hear what are some what are three practices that each of you um take in your personal lives to kind of bring more wisdom bring more virtue and goodness to your um internet consumption your your yeah internet consumption social media practices so some of mine are you know i try to i try to read things before i share them <laughs> so i'm not just like you know feeding into the virality and incendiary headlines um and i try to keep in mind like i try and second i try to not send an email that uh, or, or, or a, twi a tweet when I'm frustrated or like anxious or angry, kind of give it to the 24 hour rule. Um, and I try to I try I try to humanize the interaction like digitally mediated interaction is hard. It's hard to see a human on the other side, especially since we know bots exist. It's not always a human on the other side, especially on Twitter. <laughs> uh, but I try as much as possible. I try to remember, OK, chances are there's a human on the other side of this. And even if it's a horrible thing that's been said to me, you know, pretend I'm in person pretend I'm face to face with them and, and respond that way. So those are some things I do. I'd love to hear just a few ideas from each of you really quickly. Um, what are some practices that you do to kind of bring more wisdom, bring more virtue to your uh, internet consumption and social media practices? Do you want to go ahead, Donald? <laughs> oh, well, I'll go first. I, I've moderated discussion groups for a really long time now on the internet. So actually in cognitive therapy, one of our basic principles is the exposure is uh, one of the most robustly established mechanisms in the field of psychological research. So exposing yourself to internet trolls and insults and things in the right way um, is much better than avoiding them in the long term if you want to build up psychological resilience or like basically like to simplify things somewhat. So I've had a lot of exposure to people and one of the benefits of that is that there is nothing that anyone can say to me now that I haven't heard before. Like, so often when I'm dealing with people, if they get a bit wary on the internet and they can be difficult to deal with, I'll compare it to things that I've heard in the past and it seems relatively trivial, often by comparison. But uh, another thing that I'll do, I mentioned earlier, this basic stoic idea about broadening perspective. There's a great deal that I can say about that. The thing is that stoics have a very complex, nuanced philosophy. So here we're, we're having to simplify it an awful lot. Um, but this basic idea of broadening perspective, which takes many different forms, we mentioned the view from above earlier, uh, can be compared to findings in modern psychology in a number of ways. But one thing you can do is that if somebody says something that you think kind of upsetting or that you're becoming emotionally entangled with or, mm. or annoyed about, um, you can simply say to yourself, there are seven and a half billion other people in the world whose opinions you haven't heard yet on the matter. And, you know, just reminding yourself that this is a drop in the ocean. Um, this just happens to be the person that's in front of you on social media at the moment. Um, but you shouldn't be blinkered to the fact that there are billions of other people who probably hold slightly different or very different perspectives from the one that you happen to be speaking to. And that allows you to expose yourself. There's a trick here, which is that you, uh, it benefits you the most to continue to expose yourself to the upsetting thing but place, place it within a context in which the emotional impact of it is diluted in a rational manner. Like, so the, this is actually a very healthy strategy to employ and, and one that's similar to what so it's uh, traditionally recommended. Yeah, I can say that uh, I also have to do a lot of um, like customer service stuff. And, you know, as a general rule, these are classics lovers, you know, like, like yourselves are all watching. So you can imagine as far as an audience goes, I mean, pretty, 
pretty, pretty good, tank. awesome people <laughs> for the most part. But still, every now and then you get somebody who is really angry and they're putting out all their anger at you, you know, the whole caps. And sometimes they can be vicious. And I found that my tactic always was I'd always write the first response kind, you know, and I would just be like, just return with kindness. And I would say 90% of the time they write back and go, you know what? I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have written to you like that. Like, and they immediately apologize and they say, thank you, you know, blah, blah, blah. Literally 90% of the time. Now, of course, this is out of the classics audience. I mean, maybe in a different subculture, you might have a different ratio there. Um, and of the 10%, if they write back something nasty, I'm just like, delete you, you don't exist. I give you a chance. So that's just a good reference for everybody. You get you get to yell at me once. <laughs> I think that's such an interesting concept uh, in our modern world uh, that's depersonal and intermediated digitally is this concept of um, like emotional um, displacement, Donald. You're the you're the cognitive behavioral therapist, but like you know, people are frustrated or feel powerless in one area of their life, and then they exert that power in another area, and often that falls on you know waiters, cab drivers, mm -hmm. customer service representatives, where they you know feel like they can unleash this like inner turmoil where they felt powerless and downtrodden. I think that's a really interesting concept in our in our modern world where you know they can put that emotional baggage on someone that they don't have to see ever again, or that, that you know, they, it's easy for them to dehumanize that. Anyway, that's for a different conversation. That's something I've, I've thought a lot about, but we're going to pivot to Q&A now. Um, and Anya is going to take the lead on that. And um, I was going to merge a question that I know Donald wanted to get to with a question that I saw raised and then then give it over to Anya. But Donald, we want to hear from you about um, Marcus Aurelius's, um, the influence of his mother in his life. Someone asked in the, in the chat box, how did Marcus Aurelius treat women? So maybe tackle the relationship with his mother in the broader context of how he, uh, his relationship with women in his life. And then Anya, it's all you. Well, Marcus's mother was one of the, I would, I, I believe it's safe to say that Marcus Aurelius's mother was one of the most highly educated women at Rome. And um, she was steep, she was a Hellenophile and steeped in Greek culture and philosophy. Mm -hmm surrounded herself with a circle of intellectuals, uh, many influential figures have done in the past. She was a construction magnate. Um, her name is stamped on many bricks um, that were used in construction. She inherited from her father, uh, one of the main brick and tile fa uh, factories in Rome. So her husband died probably when she was still in her teens. Uh, she never remarried. Uh, Marcus actually refers to her affectionately as his little mother. So she wasn't a physically Aww. imposing woman, but she, in terms of her culture and intellect and her wealth and power, must have been an incredibly uh, powerful, dynamic and imposing woman. And uh, she would have been responsible to a large extent for his somewhat unorthodox education. And she seems, there's a hint that she was friends with his uh, main Stoic tutor, Junius Rusticus. Marcus mentions in passing that Junius Rusticus wrote a letter to his mother, mm -hmm. which he considered very plain spoken and, and direct in an admirable way. And he also mentions that his mother admired these old fashioned Roman Republican values of simplicity and uh, plain speech and honesty and so on. Now, Fronto compares her to the goddess Athena but you know, Front is a bit of a sycophant, but he, he, he does compare it to the goddess Athena in a, a letter that he writes. So I, I think that's a, a, a kind of striking image in a way, because that's kind of how she comes across in a way. Athena is the goddess of wisdom and culture and crafts and so on. And so they see her, they seem to see her in this kind of uh, night. This, this is a natural analogy for, for them. And Marcus says, intriguingly, that the main thing he learned from his mother, who in the absence of a father, it must have been the dominant influence on him as a, a small child. Um, it's kind of formative influence on him. He says the main thing that he took from his mother was this idea that not only should we avoid doing wrong outwardly, but we should avoid wrongdoing even in our thoughts, in our inner life, in our private life. And so I would emphasize that we see that decades later writ large in the meditations itself 
which is an entire book dedicated to a guy trying to transform, purify and improve his private inner life of thoughts and feelings like his mum told him to do when he was a, a little boy. And so that basic piece of wisdom that he gets from his mother um, arguably kind of uh, sets the stage for the whole philosophical education that follows and culminates mm -hmm. in him writing this very elaborate uh, book about self-improvement to himself, as it was originally titled. Um, his attitude towards women is a lot, is kind of a little bit tricky to infer. Um, and it's also kind of embedded in, in, in Roman values. We need to talk a little bit about the role that women play in Roman society. Um, you know, so it's that, that would be a little bit tricky to unpack briefly. However, we many of the m people typically underestimate in some regards how much we know about Marcus Aurelius as an individual. Um, our knowledge is kind of fragmentary, but we have a lot of fragments. And one of the things that we know that most people are unaware of is we have a record of his legislative actions, uh, fragmentary in form. And it's been analyzed by several commentators, scholars. And one of the themes that seems to run through it is improving the rights of women in Roman society, um, as well as also improving the rights of slaves and uh, uh, passing legislation to, to protect children. Um, so these seem to actually be some of the dominating concerns that he had uh, in terms of legislation. Um, so the Stoic doctrine, which the Stoics arguably inherit from Socrates, is that virtue is the same in men and women. That's the kind of formal way of putting it. Uh, Socrates believed that women should be educated in philosophy, and so did the Stoics. And that was an unusual view at the time. Mm to some extent. The Pythagoreans also seem to have thought women should have studied philosophy. We're told that women attended Plato's Academy down the road from me, but mm. they had to disguise themselves as men in order to get in, because women weren't allowed anywhere near Plato's school. They weren't yet allowed in the, uh, in, even in the grounds of the gymnasium uh, at the time. So the Stoic idea that you women should be taught philosophy as well was somewhat radical, but it, the precedent for that was set by Socrates. And uh, so I think Marcus probably embraced the standard Stoic view. He embraces most of the standard Stoic views. And, uh, you know, but to find specific examples of that in terms of the, the surviving Roman biographies is a lot bit tricky. Well, um, I think to pass on from Alexandra's excellent moderating and hosting, uh, it'd be great to touch on some of the questions that we've been getting in. And I know it, we've already gone over an hour, so uh, I might try to throw some of the shorter, faster ones at you first, so we can maybe get a chance to address um, a few extras. And uh, this might be one that you can also add into your thoughts, Alexandra, is um, for the first, which translation of meditations should people go for? Let's start with just the how-tos best translation of the meditations. The most popular one is Gregory Hayes. Um, Robin Hard's translation is also good. What to avoid would be the free public domain out of copyright translations that were done in the 19th century or whatever, because uh, unless you're into that kind of thing, like people often get those and then they complain that they find them hard to follow. And that's because they're really old. Like, so if you want an easy to read translation by a more modern translation, which you're going to have to pay a small amount of money for, and so the most popular ones are Gregory Hayes, Robin Hard, although Robin Waterfield has also just brought out a brand spanking new translation of the meditations with that's annotated, which is also very good. Gregory Hayes, although it's the most popular, popular is slightly less literal. Um, so uh, I defer to Donald popular. completely on meditations translation, but I will just say a plug for good translations generally. Uh, it makes all the difference in the world to have it in a, in, a, in a vernacular that we're familiar with. Like, it's great that it's free, but it's worth to pay a few dollars, uh, 10, 15, uh, to get one that is meant for our moment. And I, as an example, Anya introduced me to Emily Wilson's translation of the Odyssey, which is 
vivid and striking and beautiful and penetrating. And I, I'll admit, I attempted to read the Odyssey a number of times before, and I have the great books on my shelf. I, I, uh, I think it's like the Butler translation of the Odyssey or something, um, but like, you know, a good one, but just one that I, I kind of got lost in. I was like, you know what, this isn't capturing me, but like, I couldn't put Wilson's translation down and it not only does it make me feel smart that I can read the Odyssey, but like I can enjoy it and I can get something out of it and like be in dialogue, be, be in companionship with the um, thousands of years of, of, of wise men and women who have come before me and have, have been nurtured and nourished by that, this text as well. So just a plug for a good translation. So, and I defer to, so buy whatever Donald suggests, whatever translation Donald suggests. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna wanna check out that Robin Waterfield. Uh, I've had a few, uh, had him on Classical Wisdom before as well. And uh, he's a great guy. And so uh, I really look forward to, to reading his, I think that will be wonderful. Um, another sort of kind of question about the meditation specifically is why does he start off thanking so many people? Yeah, actually just to, I'll, I'll refer back to what the previous uh, question about his relationship with women, just as an aside, you might, again, uh, how can I put this? It, it's notable that among the people that he praises are his mother and it, although albeit fleetingly his sister, because to some Romans, it would be somewhat surprising for a man to be modeling the virtues exemplified by a woman. Um, and he doesn't mention more women, but he does acknowledge that there are virtues that his mother exhibited that he should be learning from and modeling himself, which in itself I think is, is notable for a Roman noble. Um, some of them are more sexist than that. Um, he mentions the 17 people, his tutors and his family members, and he's, uh, he actually explains later in the meditation, funnily enough, he describes what he's doing later in the book. He says that uh, if you want to um, do something that's going to, I think he says that it will fill you with joy or uh, that will be ennobling, um, you should uh, contemplate the virtues of the people who are around you. And uh, mm -hmm. that's exactly what he's doing in Book One of the Meditations. It's a stoic contemplative practice. Like he's meditating on the virtues of people, in particular Antoninus Pius, who he describes in great detail. It's also interesting that he doesn't mention certain people. By the way, that's incidentally one of several pieces of evidence that the book probably wasn't intended for publication because the fact that he praises all these people at great length and says nothing about Hadrian would have been considered damning in Roman society mm. and highly you don't controversial. Say. Yeah. yeah, what you don't say is, is uh, not mentioning someone was, was um, a big deal in Roman society. And it's very obvious that he doesn't praise Hadrian. And actually, wow. if you're really nerdy in reading this, most of the things he says about Antoninus, you can imagine in brackets after them, the words unlike Hadrian, uh, because many of them seem to contrast Antoninus with his predecessor in an unfavorable manner. For example, he says no one would ever dream of calling Antoninus Pius a sophist. Well, that's exactly what they would have called Hadrian, who surrounded himself with sophists and aspired to be one. Right. So as that, that's as an aside, if you want to really kind of read between the lines of the meditations, but he's doing a stoic contemplative exercise that he describes for us later in the book, which is trying to contemplate, verbalize and model the virtues of other people around him. And incidentally, some of those people undoubtedly, unlike Antoninus Pius, were more of a mixed bag. For example, he praises his brother Lucius Verus um, in a kind of artfully vague way. Um, and I think there's some controversy about this among historians, but I think Lucius Verus probably was um, quite a vain, um, hedonistic. I, I think it's quite possible he was a, a raging alcoholic, um, uh, maybe a depressive, um, and so probably not someone that, that Marcus saw as, as admirable uh, uh, overall, but nevertheless he finds uh, loyalty and affection in his character. Uh, that are, are worth contemplating and emulating. 
it is um it's amazing how corruption really uh, how power corrupts and you see i mean i've done a lot of work with like the julio claudian dynasty for instance and like you know nero caligula so many of them don't start off necessarily bad but now like we're like oh wouldn't want to have that guy at your dinner table so um it, it goes to show again to say from before that it, that makes uh, marcus's accomplishments all the more remarkable um um, and I guess this kind of leads into the next question, actually, with regards to, uh, and this is a common issue I think people have when they're trying to understand Stoicism, but specifically Marcus Aurelius, because does he glorify military conquest and violence? And how does that sort of sit with some of the Stoic philosophy, philosophical principles? I don't think he does. Um, actually, and I know this is a controversial subject, but so you know, nevertheless, I'm just going to trample all over it, and people can get upset with what I'm saying. If they choose to do so. I think it's the opposite. I, it's you know, having studied him for 25 years, like uh, contrary to what many people say, um, and I think what they misinterpret from the the histories, it seems to me that Marcus really is, uh, predominantly does the opposite. Uh, for instance. Throughout the meditations on virtually every page of that book, Marcus, to himself in private, advocates compassion, kindness, cosmopolitan ethics, social justice, uh, social virtue, um, affection towards it, philostorgia or natural affection towards others, brotherhood of man, all this kind of stuff. He very rarely in that book mentions Roman citizens only a couple of times, which is striking as a Roman emperor. Uh, when he talks about avoiding being alienated from other people, treating other people as his brothers and sisters, he's talking about the rest of mankind, which is an extraordinary thing for him to be doing. Mm. At Carnuntum, uh, the military HQ on the Roman frontier during the middle of what the historians call the War of Many Nations, and so the Roman chief, the tribal chieftains that he's seeing in the morning and is engaged in warfare with are probably the people he's referring to when he says that he should avoid feeling alienated from these people, that he should view them as his brothers. Um, he doesn't say Roman citizens, he says everybody. And so for that and a number of other reasons, I think that in the meditations, Marcus really appears to be doing the opposite of glorifying war. And also just as a historical aside, I, we can never be completely certain about this, but I think the most likely interpretation of the historical evidence is that the civil war that Marcus definitely faced um, was probably instigated by a faction in the Roman military and on the Senate who considered him to be too much of a military dove, um, because they certainly are portrayed as far more hawkish and aggressive militarily. And I think their beef with him was that they wanted him to more violently oppress uh, the tribal uh, races on the, on the northern frontier. And Marcus was placing more emphasis on uh, securing long-term peace the negotiation and they wanted to just kill everybody yeah. basically why <laughs> so or enslave them or whatever and he, he, he's the, so they seem to have viewed him not as a warmonger but as not enough of a warmonger and uh, you know he was uh, facing a, a you know not just a, a bit of pushback over that but a full-scale civil war yeah it's that's that's an excellent point and um like you said about when he not thanking Hadrian, sometimes what you don't do and what you don't say speaks volumes. So um, that's an excellent point. Uh, to sort of bring it more general to our current society, um, we had a few questions asking about how stoicism can impact in society. And I'd like Donald for you to answer that one. But Alexandra, I'd like to ask you first another one, which is that right now there, there are a lot of universities and high schools that are eliminating the classics. And this is something you and I have been talking about a lot. So I feel like you'll have plenty to say on the topic. Um, should we be worried? And um, do you have any advice what we can do to sort of counter this um, movement or lack thereof, I guess? 
Donald, do you want to go first? Otherwise, I can take the second question, whichever. I don't think we should eliminate the study of the classics. Um, I think we should be supporting it, funnily enough. And I think people have a great deal uh, to gain from it. Um, the idea of that it's all about dead white men, um, as people sometimes say, is seems to me, at least in the case of stoicism, uh, in, in fact, in general, but, but I, I'll talk about stoicism, absurd. Um, because stoicism was a philosophy of immigrants. Uh, it preached cosmopolitanism. Um, and so it's quite the opposite of the way that, that people want to kind of portray it in that regard. Um, so I, I think that's odd. Um, Zeno was Phoenician and uh, it was, a, you know, shipwrecked at, at Athens. Uh, most of the Stoic teachers actually came from the Middle East as far away as Babylon hmm. um, uh, or North Africa. Uh, and so uh, I think it's a very simplistic idea that people will think have this idea that it's Greek philosophy and a bunch of white guys or whatever, which is, is, is not really an accurate representation of the origins of philosophy. Hmm. I, I agree with Donald that it's concerning, of course, that um, classics departments are closing the amount of core curriculum and class hours and credit hours dedicated to great books and the liberal arts and the humanities. Those have been receding for, for decades. Um, that is concerning only because people that might not, not ever have the chance to be introduced to these um, thinkers and ideas that like their time in college might be, you know, the only place for them to do that. But uh, all is not lost. Anya and I just had a wonderful conversation with uh, Dr. James Hankins at Harvard University about how to have a robust life in the mind and gain a, a, an education in the humanities and the liberal arts outside of the classroom, simply because we can't depend on the classroom for this kind of learning. And we know that it doesn't exclusively have to take place in the classroom to happen. Uh, we've been talking about great books and great translation. You go to amazon.com or Gutenberg Press and it's free or very affordable to get access to these great books. Um, and I mean, there are still 150 people on this call and I'm sure there are people that would wanna talk about these books with, with you. You know, like it's easy to find communities of people that want to dive in and pursue wisdom and beauty and goodness and truth. Um, and Donald and Anya both, um, lead organizations and, and, and lead these kind of communities. So um, to get plugged in with those is a great option. Um, this is a topic for um, that I want my next book to be on, um, both the why of the, of the life of the mind, the humanities, but also the how. How do we create leisure time? How do we find more hours, more minutes in our day to sit and reflect and contemplate uh, and cultivate our soul? Um, and, and it's definitely possible, more possible now, perhaps than any other era, because we're wealthier, we are better educated and more literate, and we have more leisure time and more information at our disposal than any other history. So I'm, I'm optimistic about the future, and it starts with each of us deciding to, to want that and to do, have the discipline to find that in our everyday, because it's possible we can do it. So thanks, Anya, for that question. Um, and uh, Donald, do you want to add maybe to why it, or how do you think stoicism can maybe have an impact on our current society? On our current society in general? Um, I mean, actually, I, well, one thing I'll pick out specifically is that um, modern, there are three main categories of negative emotion. It's often said anger, fear, and sadness, right? And psychotherapists mainly deal, deal with uh, fear and sadness, anxiety and depression. Anger, not so much because it's an externalizing emotion. So unless you work in an institution where, like a prison or a school, where people are referred by others to perceive them as angry, uh, people don't tend to primarily self-refer for anger. So it's under-treated as a psychological problem. And yet the Stoics were smart enough to realize it's probably, in a sense, the most serious psychological problem. And although anxiety and depression also affect other people around us, uh, anger is a special case because it more directly uh, affects other people around us. It's more interpersonal by its very nature and affects, and in fact, it affects society as a whole. Uh, in, in extreme cases, uh, uh, you know, you can see anger is the cause of uh, racial, political prejudice, 
extremism and even uh, terrorism, um, and, uh, or uh, you know, also things like domestic violence. So the Stoics were right that anger is a particularly big problem. Uh, I also think there's an opportunity there because anger is undertreated, uh, and for other reasons, I, I think of anger as being a kind of royal road to self-improvement. The internet is awash with discussion of self-help, but weirdly, 99% of it is really weak on the question of anger. So some of the leading self-help gurus either say nothing about anger or give really toxic advice about anger themselves, which potentially contribute to the, the problem. And in fact, some of the leading self-help gurus are very angry people. Like, and, and and have very angry followers. Like, it's, kind of, it's kind of obvious that they're, they're making the situation worse rather than better. And uh, the, we have an entire um, book on stoic psychotherapy for anger written by Seneca that survives to this day. And uh, cognitive therapists look at it and go, oh yeah, that's weirdly contemporary in nature. He says a lot of things that are totally relevant today. So I think the big hot topic uh, for improving society uh, would be the intersection of self-improvement, psychotherapy, with social and political concerns uh, revolves around this question of dealing with our own anger and the anger of others. And Stoicism offers uh, many tools for doing that. Well, I hope that uh, your excellent work on Stoicism is getting into the hands of more people, because I think you're right that that is definitely uh, both as an individual and a societal issue that uh, that people would be uh, much improved in just to think about it because sometimes just being aware of the problem you know is is a huge step and just being aware of your anger makes you immediately less angry uh, which I think is a very valuable tool um, now we are kind of running out of time uh, I've noticed a few of the comments have just asked a Quick question. The translation that uh, Alexandra mentioned before is the Emily Wilson translation of the Odyssey. And it, I would say there's two main reasons why that translation is so good, which is the question is one, it's done all in modern English. So you can just read without, if you're reading these, you know, beautifully translated by 19th century translations, you're translating to a previous form of English. So cut the, cut the different translations. Because remember, that's a translation of a translation. So go straight to a modern translation and then you can get straight to the ideas. But also um, she does a great job of maintaining the sense of rhythm uh, that so you get the sense of poetry, the lyric poetry in it. It's a different type of poetry um, rhythm wise, but it still conveys that idea that makes it read so flow so naturally. Um, but because we we're running quite out of time, we've had so many great questions. We will try to field some of them uh, afterwards in a follow-up email. Uh, but so I'd like to end, if I may, because this is another question I've had so many people ask for both Donald and Alexandra. Um, what is your favorite Marcus Aurelius quote? Well, uh, Alexandra, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to. Um, this uh, this one that really resonates with me: the the soul is dyed the color of its thoughts. And I love that because it gets to this theme that's come up a number of times um, this conversation tonight about how the the way we spend our time, um, what we consume, that creates an indelible print on our on our psyche on our soul uh it creates it, it cultivates us it, it creates who, who we are our personality what we love and i take that as such um it's a beautiful line a beautiful beautifully prosaic but also it's encouraging um that we can each choose to take every moment captive and see no moment of time, no, nothing that we do is as, as neutral, but everything is an opportunity to, um, to be kind of sowing the seeds of eternity and, and, and the transcendent part of our humanity and our, and our soul, the thing that, 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 you know, according to many religions, platonic philosophy lives on that is immortal. Um, so I, I thought that was a really beautiful, beautiful line. I think that's a beautiful one. Donald, you have one. I know we put you a bit on the spotlight. I like that quote too. There are many that I like, but one of them that I like is that when he says, you know, we should be like a, a rocky headland 
um, that allows the raging seas uh, allow, around it to uh, remains untouched by them uh, and uh, allows them to abate naturally. I think this is a, a good quote because it really reminds me of one of the most fundamental principles of modern psychotherapy, which is what we call exposure therapy, emotional habituation. And it's the idea that we should expose ourselves to uh, the raging storms of anxiety, for example, and patiently allow it to run up steam and abate naturally. And that's one of the main things that psychotherapists do with clients is to allow them to face their fears, experience anxiety, and then simply stand their ground and wait for it to wear off naturally, which seems to me to be what he's describing in that passage. Beautifully said. Um, now, we're, we're going to finish up. And so I just want to just say, I, I saw there was a few questions about where they can learn more about Stoicism and Marcus Aurelius. Um, I do want to mention again Donald's excellent book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. Uh, also, Donald, I think you also have a few courses as well for people who want to learn more. Then can you maybe yeah. just mention where you can find that? There's like courses and stuff that people can find if they go to my website, which is just donaldrobertson.name. And there's a bunch of other free resources there as well. Um, and also, like one of the main resources is there's a non-profit organization called modernstoicism.com. Uh, I'm one of the founding members of it. It was set up about 10 years ago by Christopher Kill, who's Professor Emeritus of Ancient Thought at Exeter University. And it's run by a, a multidisciplinary team of volunteers. It runs Stoicon, the annual conference, Stoic Week, a free online course, it does research on Stoicism, and it has about 600 odd articles on the Stoicism Today blog. So it's a kind of hub for information about Stoicism. It's a non profit organization. And like I said, the website for that is just modernstoicism.com. People are welcome to go there and, and check that out if they want to learn more. And uh, I'd also like to refer to Alexandra's newsletter. And maybe you can also mention, Alexandra, before we go, our next event, which is next week, for people who enjoy spending your time learning about the classics, about ancient history, about ancient philosophy, uh, you can go to Alexandra's website, Civic Renaissance. Um, but also, we will be doing another event. I'll, let, I'll pass you on to let uh, everyone know about next week's event. I think it's at the noon. Well, I'll let you mention it. Yes, noon on June 22nd, we are um, having a conversation about how to start a civic renaissance. And we are bringing in um, a Petrarch scholar. And Petrarch, as many of you know, um, loved the Greco-Roman thinkers, especially the Roman thinkers. Um, and he uh, was able to translate the ideas of people like, of thinkers like Marcus Aurelius to his own moment uh, in a time that had just emerged from plague as well. Um, the bubonic plague had killed a third, two thirds of his native Florence, where he was from, and it was just a world that was grappling with, you know, uh, uh, power imbalance, war, plague, pestilence, death, and he turned to ideas. He turned to the love of wisdom and virtue uh, for solace and consolation, and was able to communicate to his culture uh, why ideas and, and the life of the mind, the great conversation, um, could help them too. And so we're going to talk about uh, Petrarch and his life and his intellectual influences and, and what we can learn from Petrarch and how we can maybe start our own renaissance in our moment today at a, at a very unique uh, kind of inflection point of history that we find ourselves in right now. Um, so we will share the information about our event next week um, in the chat and also um, in, a, in, a, in a follow up email as well. So you guys can hopefully join us. And thank you so much to each of you for being here. Last chance to uh, tweet at us and hopefully one of, one of five copies of Donald's book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. I think Don, a link to Donald's book is gonna be here in the chat as well. But thanks so much to all of you for joining us. It's been a wonderful conversation. Donald, you are a wealth of wisdom. I leave every conversation with you better and more joyful and fulfilled. You're like my favorite therapist. This is wonderful. <laughs> so thank you for being here. Thank you for, thanks to Anya. Um, Anya and Phil together were incredible, incredible tech team. And Anya also. Uh, I did none of the tech. I just listened to Phil. I just, whatever I, Phil said. Yeah, I know. Phil, I mean, goes. Phil is here. Phil is the behind the scenes magician who, who made um, all of this seem seamless. It was not very seamless. So um, thanks to all of you for bearing with us on our tech uh, trial run with Zoom and Phil especially. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Um, so yeah, there it's Phil. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so wonderful to be with all you, all of you tonight, and I hope this is one of many conversations um, like this to come. So thanks again. 
Yeah, thank you, everyone. And can I just one last tiny point? It, yeah. Please, if you are a regular to our events, please let us know what you think about how we use Zoom versus GoToWebinar. Um, please be in touch with us. We loved getting your feedback. I love seeing everyone's comments and involved. And also just to plug Classical Wisdom, please check out Classical Wisdom. Um, uh, in addition to next week's event, I'll also be having an event in August. Uh, a symposium on the fall of nations and the end of empires with Neil Ferguson, Barry Strauss, Paul Cartlidge, so it should be another big event. Um, so thank you everybody, uh, and I hope you had a wonderful, wonderful day. Yep. Thanks everyone. Bye everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, all right. I mean, when it comes to the video, you're just gonna snap this here, right? Let me just, I will close that and.